Well, hello everybody and welcome to yet another incredible edition of Unearthed. I have a remarkable guest with me today. His name is Aaron Sorensen. Aaron is the Vice President of Quality based in Utah, USA at our corporate HQ. And I've invited him today to join me on this interview to talk all through the science around our Certified Pure Testing Grade Model. This is unique to doTERRA and I tell you what, you are in for a real treat because the information shared today is just expanding on what we learnt recently at the CPTG tour. So please get your pens and paper ready. Today is going to be an interesting interview. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Jess. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to, to walk through this with you today. I've got my pen and paper ready too, because I know even though we've been chatting for a little while now about this topic, and we've just come off the back of an incredible tour across Australia and New Zealand, I still have more to learn. So uh, let's not waste any time with chit chat. I would love if you could delve straight into your 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 talk for today. You bet. I'm, I don't know, everyone gets super excited about talking in-depth chemistry. So that's what's <laughs> going to bring the crowds in, right? Very good. No, let me go ahead and, and share my screen here and we'll uh, we'll get started. Okay, well, good. Well, uh, so this is a bit of a recap from the CPTG tour that recently concluded and I uh, really appreciated everything that took place there and all the time and effort that went into it. And I'm excited to continue uh, sharing my passion and some of the things that I've done with doTERRA for a very long time. So uh, thanks, Jess, for setting this up. You're welcome. Um, did want to just introduce myself a little more. Uh, I like getting to know people. Okay, my, as Jess uh, so, so well introduced uh, myself, I'm Aaron Sorensen. I'm the Vice President of Quality for doTERRA and I've been around the essential oil industry in a variety of different ways for a number of years now, almost 15 years, um, and gone through and done a lot of different things in my life that's led me to this path and wanted to walk you through that a little bit as part of an introduction. But I first wanted to talk about the most important part of my life and who I am, and that's my family. And so this is a, a recent picture of, of my, my family, my lovely wife, Savannah, who we just recently had our 17 year anniversary. Oh, wow. And we have four children. Uh, my oldest daughter uh, next to me in that picture is Jade. And then Dally, who's next to my wife, and she went on the tour with me and was able to experience this. And uh, we had a lot of exciting experiences as we went through Australia and New Zealand there. And then in front of me is my son, Gunner, and uh, in front of my wife is Brock, our, our youngest. But uh, we like to do a lot of different things together and try and uh, have fun and also uh, education and challenge each other. And um, we, we have a really good time. Oh, beautiful. Uh, next, moving on a little bit to my experience side of things, um, more, uh, we'll start with the education side. I, I began my educational uh, career, I did my bachelor's degree at the University of Utah, studying chemistry and material engineering, and that was one of the introductions. I'd always had an affinity for sciences, whether it was physics, um, but as I uh, got a scholarship to study chemistry, uh, that uh, really became a passion for me, and I really enjoyed a lot of different aspects and the complexity of chemistry and it, how much it tells us about the world around us. As you look at the, uh, the building blocks, the elements that make up our lives and everything around us, and there's still so much to learn there and so much we haven't even touched that it's just uh, continually expanding an exciting field. Um, and so I, uh, and then I'm doing a, a doctoral degree, still pursuing a doctorate at the University of Miami. That's in biochemistry. So again, bringing in some of the biology with chemistry side there and trying to do that in, in the um, loads of spare time that I have between family and work and, and everything else that I'm trying to do. But uh, again, wanting to continue my education and um, continue to understand this world around us. Next, I wanted to talk about some of my work experience, and I start with a company that actually just before I graduated from University of Utah with my bachelor's degree, I was made an offer with a, a local company in Utah, where I'm where I'm from, uh, called Ultradent, and they produce all types of dental products. So I was a formulation chemist with them, and I developed different types of whitening gels and toothpastes, uh, everything that a dentist would use. Uh, this company produces. And that was my first introduction to essential oils. 
as we looked at various toothpastes and again, uh, whitening gels, the flavoring in them, uh, they would have a variety of different essential oils that would be used in those products. And that was uh, my first foray into this fascinating field of essential oils and the variety of ways that they're used. Uh, that's what really led me into it as I learned more about essential oils. I guarantee everyone uses them every day and probably doesn't realize it. Mm -hmm. um, and whether it's a pure essential oil or a fabricated, that's another story. And we'll get much more into that. But uh, I, I really, essential oils are ubiquitous throughout the world and in the products that we use. And so understanding them helps us better understand a lot of things that we're using in our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. So um, with a couple other stops, but after a few years uh, in my company I started with, there was a startup company that uh, I was introduced to and wanted to be a part of called Alchemy Aromatics. Now, Alchemy was my first real entirely focused on essential oils. Alchemy was a brokerage company that uh, um, sourced, um, tested, but also um, distributed and did quite a few other things with essential oils. That was where at Alchemy, why I learned the ins and outs of how the essential oil industry really works. And when we say adulteration and why it's so prevalent and the financial incentives that come with, uh, I'll say traditional sourcing or uh, what is typically happening within sourcing essential oils, I learned all of that as the COO in that company. I was the man behind the curtain, if you will. I knew all of these things because I was doing them. And anyway, well, uh, like I said, that's a little bit of a foreshadowing. I want to talk about that quite a bit more and help you understand uh, the difference between typical industry and doTERRA CPTG and its mode of sourcing. So while at Alchemy and learning the ins and outs of the industry and frankly, some of the dishonesty, um, lack of integrity, I noticed that there was no laboratory that was able to test for the types of adulteration that were taking place on a very, very regular basis. And so this is where I first met Dr. Satyal, if any of you are familiar with him. And he and I uh, gained a close friendship and companionship, and we uh, started a, a company called Aromatic Plant Research Center. And that was one of uh, the connections. And there was work done with doTERRA at that time, too, where we would test essential oils, uh, looking for our specific techniques. We developed a very unique method uh, with our experience for testing purity and uh, avoiding contamination and adulteration in essential oils. And uh, that's where I think many people may have been introduced to me as my, uh, my time at APRC. As I look to expand APRC, um, and I had a very close relationship with Corey Lindley and a Emily Wright and many of the owners of doTERRA. Um, I wanted to, the business was growing and wanted to expand my clientele. And they knew that what we could do was very unique and didn't want uh, competitors and others to have those uh, secrets of the trade, if you will, uh, that uh, doTERRA is so good at ensuring uh, take place with every batch of oil. Um, so uh, we made a deal in 2020 to have the components that APRC was doing brought in-house. Part of that was me coming to help manage the quality teams at doTERRA and helping to continue uh, the CPTG evolution and, and legacy that uh, they had started many years ago. So, um, so now, yes, I am the vice president of quality. I have been for a couple years now, a few years now at, at doTERRA. APRC still exists and is independently uh, operated there uh, for the most part. Um, but really everything for the most part we had done is now in-house with doTERRA through that partial acquisition. Okay, so let's talk a little bit, about, let's get back to some of the basics here. And I think this is important um, that we all understand where essential oils come from. As we talk about this, it'll lead very well into then how does adulteration take place and what is it and how do we avoid it? Um, and so let's just talk uh, about the basics of what an essential oil is. Uh, many, many different types of plants produce an oil. Not all plants do, but it does take quite a bit of energy for a plant to produce an essential oil. And so there is a specific need 
the oil is meeting for that plant. It could be protecting the plant from uh, microorganisms or um, even uh, different species, uh, keeping them from getting eaten. Um, in fact, I know um, kangaroos are used as groundskeepers on the many of the tea tree farms throughout Australia because they'll eat uh, all the other um, weeds and, and anyway, other uh, things that are growing, but they leave the tea tree alone. It apparently doesn't taste good. So it's doing its job of protecting the plant. Uh, and that's just one example that uh, I've witnessed myself. And for the first time I saw kangaroos was many years ago on plantations in Australia. Um, so uh, anyway, so there's, and they, the essential oils do grow in a variety of places on the plant, depending on what it's intended to do. If it's if it's in the flowering parts, it's to attract pollinators. Uh, uh, again, lavender or ylang-ylang, they release those terpenes, those natural compounds to attract pollinators and continue to propagate. Um, if it's in the, the bark of the, of the tree, it's to protect it more. If it's within the leaves, again, more protection uh, and even into the, the, the roots, uh, it's all it's all designed to, um, again, protect, uh, to attract, to uh, help the, help protect the plant and, and keep it so it's healthy and strong. So um, then let's look at, now that we know uh, kind of where essential oils come from and, and uh, why the plants produce them, how do we obtain them? And the most uh, common and the tra uh, traditional means is steam distillation. And that's been used for, thousands of years. And it's really pretty straightforward. Uh, you take the raw material, whether it's a flower, some of the bark, a root, and you put it into a still. And then you, uh, there's a variety of ways, whether it's through direct injection or what's called um, uh, wet distillation, uh, where you put the water right in the still. But anyway, you heat it up so that the water uh, is become steam or steam is directly injected. And as that, uh, the pressure of the steam, the heat of the steam, and as it rises up through the raw material, it pulls those lighter compounds, those volatile compounds, the essential oil from the raw material. And so the, uh, the water, the steam and the oil go together and come up through the top of the column, as you can see here. And then as it uh, in a gas phase comes through and goes into a condenser, in essence, that's just a, a container that will then cool things down. Often there's water wrapped around it that's continually pushed through or pumped through that will then bring the temperature down and have that water and oil go back to a liquid phase. And as it goes back through the condenser, it's then uh, uh, let off into the separator. And that separator then just really lets it sit. And where the essential oils are usually lighter, they're um, nonpolar. Uh, where the water is very polar, that's why their physical properties allow them to separate. And most oils go to the top. There's a few that are heavier and go to the bottom, like wintergreen or clove. Um, but most of them, there's a nice clean separation. And then we can uh, get the oil off of the, the top of the, the separator there. And the, um, the water that comes through uh, is still, it's called um, uh, floral water or hydrosol. Mm -hmm. And there's many different uses for that product as well as there's still uh, more of the, the, the water loving components within the raw material are now in the water itself. So there's also often use for the, um, for the uh, water component of the distillation there. All right. So let's talk, let's talk about uh, one more um, uh, common way to, to get an essential oil. And that's, this is usually exclusively with citruses. And so you take the rind of the citrus and through uh, physical means, you'll press the rind, and whether it's through a screw pump or through some other physical press, you get the oil out of the, the rind by pushing it out. So that's where the term expression comes from. Mm -hmm. um, it's also called cold press, just because it's done at room temperature versus heating it up to boiling. Mm. Pardon me. Um, but anyway, so um, you get the oil out of that, Excuse me. Um, and then uh, it does require a little bit of cleanup because it's coming straight from there. That sometimes some of the natural waxes and things uh, will come through with those citrus oils and so do some filtering and things like that. But uh, this is another common way to get essential oils. And so if you see um, CP with a, uh, an essential oil, that means it's cold pressed and it's been expressed. 
where you could get you can still do the same thing with distillation and get a, a distilled oil that has slightly different chemistry depending on the, the means you use. So the final one I wanted to uh, talk about here is is not technically an essential oil, but I'm sure everyone's heard of extracts. So what's the difference between an essential oil and an extract? There's a similar process with extracts where you put it into a still, but really instead of using steam, you'll use some kind of solvent or um, a, a agent that will go in and pull those components from, from the raw material. It could be an alcohol, um, hexane is also commonly used. If you've heard of CO2 extraction, so you put enough pressure onto carbon dioxide to where it becomes a liquid, and then you put it through the material, it'll pull out a lot of the terpenes and sometimes some of the heavier components too that don't come through in traditional distillation. Um, and then, uh, then that um, solvent is evaporated off you're left with just what was pulled from that material. Mm. And go through other processes, the different washings and cleanings and things like that to get the end product that you want. Um, but this is done very commonly in the perfume industry and, and some other industries. Now you do need to be careful because sometimes the cheapest solvents, if you're doing big production, are also the most toxic. And if um, companies are more interested in doing what's least expensive, versus what's the safest, it's it's nearly impossible to get all of the solvent out of that end component. There's residual solvent testing that's very common in a number of industries because it's very difficult to get that solvent all the way out. Mm -hmm. So you need to be mindful of that. And also it's something you don't need to be overly concerned about with an essential oil where it's just water or there's the physical pressing of the oil to get it out. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, that's so interesting. And is that similar uh, to what we've done with the vanilla, knowing that our vanilla that was launched last year is actually an absolute? And is that that process or is that a different process again? No, it is. And there's a variety of ways. And so there are actually some plants, jasmine's another one, to where it's very difficult or you don't get any oil out of uh, the raw material um, through traditional means. And so, uh, yes, if you wanted uh, some things uh, like, like a vanilla, it's much more um, uh, effective and you get the components that you want using a solvent extraction, a, a uh, an, express, uh, an extraction in that means. And that what that really does, is, as long as you do it correctly and you monitor it right, it, it can be very safe. And it gets you a broader array of components. But yes, vanilla is a good example to where uh, using an extract is um, gets you uh, more what you're looking for. Right. So those little bottles that have jasmine in it, for example, or or vanilla are really extra special, are they? They are. They are. And doTERRA, there's a few blends where they'll use um, extract an extract um, in, in different ways. Uh, so uh, osmanthus and other things like that, um, where they're only used in blends. Some of those are, and there's CO2 extracts too that are used in a variety of different ways to, to obtain that really rare uh, component that doTERRA is looking for. Oh, so interesting. Okay. So let's go back a little bit to, uh, I talked about alchemy and some of the uh, things that I've done there. And so let's let's really touch on traditional sourcing of essential oils. So when we say an essential oil broker, and just as the term describes any other industry, uh, an intermediate, someone who takes control and and uh, whether it's just through transportation or consolidation or helps a company do things that they don't have the knowledge or the resources to do themselves, there's a lot. It's very common to have essential oil brokers. And Again, this is what I did. And so we'll walk through it here a bit. You can have you know, the, the, the farm itself and adulteration can take place at every single one of these steps. It does take place at every single one of these steps. Now it's least common if the, if the farmer themselves are just harvesting, um, but they can where they wanna get, if they're paid by weight, they can, you know, they're taking too much of the plant. Uh, they're taking more than, uh, 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 adding weight in a variety of ways that may not be the the material that the, the distiller would want. Anyway, there's a lot of different ways to try and um, improve margins, uh, get more money. And so working with farmers at source is important to ensure you get the right mater starting material uh, that you're going to use to produce the essential oil. 
Mm. Yeah, at distillation, and sometimes the farmer and the stiller are one and the same, and that's what doTERRA does a lot, is try and find those that are, are doing um, both so that uh, there's less steps within the process. But there's a lot of things that happen at the distillation. I've I've been, <laughs> I've seen uh, where distillers will, uh, and we'll get into this a touch, but take isolated components, uh, maybe synthetics, and they'll douse the raw material. Let's say it's a lavender flowers. They'll then pour linalool or linal acetate isolate into it, into the distillation. And then so as that the natural process happens, though, that component will volatilize and come through the oil. So if you just take a sample at the, at the still, you're thinking you're getting it from the still. It's got to be pure. That's not always the case, too. There's a lot of ways to cheat the system. Wow. So, uh, again, being very mindful, understanding the pitfalls, the ins and outs of the trade is extremely important in, in ensuring purity in essential oils. And, and this is all just part of CPTG and everything that doTERRA spends a lot of time ensuring happens so that they are honest and, and forthright. And when you when they say they've got pure oils, man, like that's that's really truthful and it's saying something. Yeah. So a lot of times the next step, depending on the country that you're in, then there's various distillers that'll be consolidated to an in-country broker. Again, very common. Now, uh, once they consolidate things, they'll add things, they'll mix things together, they'll um, increase their volumes, lower their costs, be able to in, uh, improve their profit margins at that point in the distribution. Then oftentimes it's sent to a larger US or EU broker. Um, and this is where Alchemy came to play, where, where I was in, in the mix. Um, and as we would get those oils in, we would look at it um, and we'll walk through this in just a moment and see how can we make more money off of this too. Uh, what is it we can add and how can we expand the, uh, the vo volume of this oil and still make it look great um, and make ourselves quite a bit of money. I should add too, I keep using that name. I'm not meaning to be disparaging, but Alchemy no longer exists, just so you know. So it's a company that that's why I feel okay saying the name is it, it doesn't exist anymore. So um, I'm not disparaging an existing company. Um, but anyway, and so oftentimes an essential oil company will buy from these brokers and they are told, and there's GCMS and all the proof in the world that it's pure. It's oftentimes this company genuinely does not know um, what they're getting. They truly believe, and they believe they've got proof that what they're getting is pure. It's not um, most of the time. Eighty percent of the time is what my research, our research, has shown. As we've tested many, many samples throughout the market, and again, where I was involved with all of all of this, I know the ins and outs and why it's not pure, and why all these claims of uh, being exactly like doTERRA are just not true because I've been on both sides of this. So um, be very cautious. If you're purchasing an essential oil for much cheaper, um, you're getting what you pay for. Um, and also uh, simple things like a, a GCMS uh, don't guarantee purity. And unless unless you're entirely involved in every step of the supply chain, there is so much opportunity for adulteration and contamination that, and there's so much motivation financially to have that happen. Mm -hmm. It is going to happen. And so um, fly-by-night companies, or if you're um, buying online or um, at a superstore, mm -hmm. very, very good chance it's adulterated. Yes. That's such a good point. And, and I didn't even realize that you could adulterate the oil before it's even distilled. Like that's mind blowing to me. And that would technically hack the GCMS reporting too, right? Because it would elevate what you would see as linalool and linalool acetate in, which are yep. technically the active components, right, of lavender. That's just I knew I was going to learn something today. I knew I was going to learn lots of things, but that's actually blown my mind. Um, and I really love, and I, I know we'll be talking about this a little bit later briefly, and on the tour we talked about it a fair bit, but that quality and making sure that those farmers are, are looked after and we are able to be at the source to help them understand what needs to be done but also prevent 
those additives going in, those synthetics going in, that is just, that's literally what sets us apart from every other essential oil company in the market, right? Absolutely. And very well said. And so from a, a CPTG perspective, you know, the promise to our customers that hey, this is the purest oil on the market available today. But the other arm of that uh, big piece of it, too, is the co-impact sourcing. Mm -hmm. And that's not just a tagline. It's not just marketing. Um, doTERRA truly is at source working with farmers. We we know our sourcers. We know the farmers very, very well. And we treat them well and want them to be empowered and encourage them to, to produce the best products that they can, um, give them a good life, good uh, means of income. And so it's reciprocal. Uh, mm -hmm. They're giving us what we promise and we're helping them to continue to uh, provide for themselves. And there's tens of thousands, I, I don't even know the current number of all of the individuals and families and farms that have been impacted by co-impact sourcing, which is a big part of CPTG. It's, it's just a beautiful way to set it up and to ensure that you're mindful of everything that's happening because doTERRA knows what really happens in the market and how traditional sourcing takes place. And so theirs is very different. And every farmer, every distiller, every individual that we work with along that supply chain knows that we know all those ins and outs, whether, uh, you know, again, it's like, oh, no, come come watch the distillation. We'll let you take a sample right from the still and you can test it yourself. Um, I, I've seen that behind the scenes. And even that you need to be mindful of, as I've mentioned, so. It's just so interesting. And it's even, and I know that uh, I've been on a couple of sourcing trips and you you probably have as well from the sounds of it. So we've seen firsthand that it's it's not even just the farmers and it's not mm -hmm. the, the local families that are impacted by this care and consideration. It actually spreads out into community engagement. I was recently up in Kununurra and I was able to see our sandalwood plantation, which was just absolutely remarkable. Mm -hmm. The community is being impacted in a positive way because of doTERRA, the Healing Hands Foundation, our co-impact sourcing model, and even our suppliers. It's a literally a chain of care that flows through so that the, the young man that's going to the local high school who's got absolutely nothing to do with these essential oils or the sandalwood plantation, for that matter, is directly impacted as a result of the heart of this company. It just needs to be shouted from the rooftops, I think. It is so unique and so special. Yep. Yeah, that that that's exactly right. And and you know, it is it depending on because again, essential oils are grown all over the world. In first world countries, we get much peppermint from the United States and birch from the United States, uh, uh tea tree and sandalwood from Australia. So it's it's not just these third world countries where it's obvious the needs, but co-impact sourcing uh, and CPTG impacts everybody mm -hmm. uh, at the sourcing level, at the end product level. So it does uh, the Healing Hands Foundation too, as you mentioned, is a big part of that. And it's all, again, these organizations and it's it's so uh, beautifully aligned to um, help everyone, uh, help the world heal, um, as doTERRA says. Uh, and so... Uh, yeah, if it's if it's in a rural country, um, maybe it's a well that they need. Maybe it's a school. Maybe it's a hospital. Maybe it's just providing opportunities for um, someone going to school to um, pursue a career. Um, again, it's it, we look at what's the need, where this is grown, and tailor it to be effective for that community. It's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. So speaking of that source, and I think that's a good lead in too, and where, again, like hopefully I'm conveying like how important it is to know every step of your supply chain. When, and when it comes to essential oils, there's just so much opportunity for adulteration and to impact the quality of the product that getting to know the individuals, the, the, the farms, the plants themselves, the selection of the seeds, the, the types of groups there. So doTERRA does this on an unprecedented scale. And I've had the opportunity to be a part of many of those and, and be able to go through and, and see that. And uh, again, gain the, gain the trust of, of these individuals and, and then they've gained our trust too uh, through years of setting this up. 
Mm. And so uh, that that quality starts at the source. CPTG, one of the biggest parts of it is knowing where it's coming from and knowing, again, very intimately uh, what's what's happening with each of the plants and uh, the, the raw material, whatever it may be, whether it's frankincense or lavender or tea tree or, uh, or peppermint, they'll all have their u- unique nuances and understanding what makes each of those different and unique and knowing what to look for in them to ensure purity um, is honestly, I think the biggest part. If you can catch problems before uh, at the very beginning, then it just makes things far, far much, uh, far more simple down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and doTERRA does an unbelievable job of that. Um, so uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, contamination versus adulteration. I don't know, sometimes they're used synonymously. Um, in my eyes, they are not. And this is more my definitions here, I admit. But contamination um, is something that was unintentional. Um, you know, it, during the distillation process or through packaging or uh, even through raw material gathering, uh, there are innocent mistakes that can take place. Um, you know, using uh, in uh, one of some of the examples I've seen where small farmers where their full uh, season of distillation would produce one water bottle worth of oil. So they take what they have and they put it in a water bottle. Unfortunately, because of the chemical nature of the essential oil and that water bottle, it's low de- uh, low density polyethylene, it'll just leach the plastic right out of it. Uh, it'll start eating that plastic and it contaminates the oil. It will have plasticizers within it. And so educating uh, each of the the, the steps that uh, about proper storage and things like that too. There is also uh, where th- when things settle, um, there'll be, uh, could be, uh, yeah, you know, small leaves or waxes, as I mentioned, too, in different citruses. Some things you can filter out and still uh, remove a, a contaminant. Others, uh, it's not possible. It's not financially viable to remove that contamination. So education upstream on being able to avoid that. But uh, this is one of the biggest things we look for in all of our testing is any indication of contamination and the variety of ways that that can happen. And again, going back upstream through the the communication that we have and letting people know, hey, this is what we're seeing and this is likely where it came from. Let's hunt it down and let's make sure that it's it's improved. And um, sometimes we've had to uh, reject and and, and uh, dispose of oil that doesn't meet our CPTG standards. It's gotten to where that's pretty rare, but something we're constantly vigilant and looking for. Mm. So let's get into one of the the real big things. And so we've been talking about adulteration and how that's different from contamination. Um, Adulteration is absolutely done on purpose. It's financially motivated and there are huge financial motivations to do this. It's intentional and it's happening all the time. Uh, At every step, as we talked about too, there's a, a possibility, there's the likelihood even that adulterations happening to where something's being added to an oil to increase the yield and decrease the, the amount that you have. So, and uh, as I'd mentioned before too, in our testing, which is you know many uh, more than 10 years and, and beyond as we've worked with other research facilities too, um, 80% of oils on the market do have adulteration or contamination in some fashion. It's, it's extremely common is the bottom line. Excuse me a moment. That just blows my mind of that statistic, that more than 80%. And, and you've said yep. yourself, you know, how much you've tested those those products to see. Um, even those those other companies, and we're definitely not in the business of putting another company down to highlight our own, but when you see these practices that it's very, very likely, 80% likely, um, that their products are adulterated. And again, I, I would be willing to bet the vast majority of them do not know it. Like they they haven't had the experience to or understand the industry um, like doTERRA has taken the time, the effort. It's it's a lot of investment of time, personnel, money to be able to ensure an oil is pure. And uh, many companies just don't have the ability to do that. And mm-hmm. so they, they have to trust and um so again, it, I don't think I, I honestly don't believe it's um, intentional or there's anything uh, you know um, 
manipulative on their side or intentional man manip being manipulative, but they just don't know and don't know what to look for when we say oils are adulterated. Yeah. Wow. So um, let's do a little bit, let's go a little bit deeper and talk about some of the ways that this adulteration happens. So um, let's go through, I, I've just uh, demonstrated four here, talk, or I'll talk about four, um, but some of the most common uh, is just diluting with a, a, a non vile non-volatile component. So a, a castor oil, some type of vegetable oil, a cooking oil, something that's very common, even that in rural parts of, of anywhere in the world, you could get your hands on for an expense, for very inexpensively. And you can add it to, to your oil, even a 10% addition, you know, that's 10% more oil you have to sell. And that's, um, there's a lot of financial motivation to do that. And can't necessarily blame people where this is their life livelihood and they're counting on it to support themselves. Um, but uh, if, and even a GCMS, because it's a non-volatile uh, vegetable oil or cooking oil, if you don't know what you're looking for, it won't pick it up and it'll look like a pure oil, even though it may have been diluted, even, uh, you know, sometimes uh, 50, 60% with a carrier oil. So, um, it's very, very common that that very simple addition takes place and um, and it's sold not that way. Now, I will make the distinction that in the end use, you know, where you want to intentionally dilute with a carrier oil, like a coconut oil or or any other kind of a lotion, even things like that, uh, that's uh, something good where you're getting the proper dosage, if you will. Now, of course, being up front and saying, hey, this is what you're buying and it's already in the proper amount of carrier oil, uh, that's appropriate. Um, but this is where you're being intentionally deceitful with it and it's not what you intended to buy. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. So for the likes of, you know, as we were talking about earlier, the absolutes, a lot of these absolutes like vanilla do come out quite thick. And so they mm -hmm. are pre-combined with fractionated coconut oil in that five mil bottle so that we can use it so that yep. it's easy to to actually, you know, to ingest, for example, or use in our DIYs or even the touch versions of our products because they're pre-combined or pre-diluted with FZO. We're able to topically apply directly onto our skin. Um, that's such a good and valid point because it's it's about what you're getting up at face value and and what you're getting, what you'll pay for. I know for myself, I don't want to pay for a product if what I'm really getting is only 40% of the product mm -hmm. and the rest is simply uh, castor oil and, or mm -hmm. a cheap carrier oil that's really not providing my system any any value. Right. Yep. And where did that come from? And you know what, what was in that castor oil? And yeah. anyway, yeah, there's a lot of questions yeah. and uh, you know, is this something I I should be putting on my body if I'm not sure it's what I want it to be? That's so true. So, mm. Yep. So um, another one of the most common ones is adding of synthetic components. Um, and so I've broken this out into two different pieces here. Um, one of the most common and inexpensive ways is to take byproducts of the petroleum industry. And so, of course, gas and oil, um, There's uh, it's a big business um, all around the world. But one of the byproducts of the gas and oil industry is uh, phenols. Pretty simple compounds, but uh, they are perfect for doing simple chemical reactions. And you can make most terpenes, and terpenes make up, uh, uh, that's what essential oils are, is the chemical class is terpenes for the vast majority of them. But you can take these phenols and through simple chemical reactions, make any kind of terpene you want. You can make linal, linal acetate, alpha pinene, um, uh, beta caryophylline, uh, and then add that very cheap synthetically derived component to the essential oil where it does naturally occur there, but you're boosting it with this petroleum based product. Um, and sometimes one of the only ways to detect that is through carbon dating, uh, through C14 testing to see if the precursor um, is from new material, it's only a couple years old, or if it's millions of years old, you know that um, this has taken place and you're actually putting a petroleum-based product on yourself. Again, very commonly done. Wow. 
Uh, the other side would be to take a natural precursor. Again, so there's some big industries. I'll, I'll use uh, the paper industry as an example, where we produce a lot of paper. It takes it from trees and many trees, uh, pine oils. The nat one of the most natural um, terpenes in that is uh, uh, alpha pinene. And so a byproduct of the paper production industry is alpha pinene. And they get a vast amount of this. It's natural. It just came from a tree through this byproduct there. But you can take alpha pinene in a similar fashion and turn it into any other type of um, terpene that you'd like as well. Because it's a byproduct, you can get it extremely inexpensively. And there's simple, simple, simple chemical processes to be able to get the terpene that you want and be able to add to any essential oil too. So you can get a natural precursor that is still synthetically derived and added to an oil um, to decrease the cost of the producer and sell it off as a pure oil. Mm. So uh, uh, another type is what we call fractional distillation or, or natural isolates. And so you can have uh, oils that um, maybe are at very high yielding and they are uh, have a, a common uh, component. We'll, we'll use uh, hoe wood, for example. Uh, when you distill it, it's very high yield, it's inexpensive, it's abundant, and it's almost entirely linalool. And so you can take that linalool and isolate it so it's pure linalool and add it to um, bergamot. Uh, you can add it to uh, lavender, many other uh, oils where linalool is naturally occurring and boost it in that fashion. Um, but uh, again, it cuts your costs and it's diluting the rest of the components within there. Mm -hmm. so. Wow. The last one is just, um, uh, maybe it's uh, best termed as mislabeling or misbranding, where you take a, a, a less expensive oil and sell it as a more expensive oil because they have similar chemistry. Mm -hmm. So um, like a cassia uh, versus a cinnamon bark. They do have similar chemistry. Uh, ceramic aldehyde is one of the major components. Um, and so it's very common to try and sell cassia as cinnamon bark um, just because you can make more money on it. Cinnamon bark is much rarer. Um, it's uh, more difficult to produce. Um, and so it's you can mix the if you want to take a little bit of cinnamon bark and add cassia to it, um, reduce your costs and sell it as cinnamon bark. Or again, we see it all the time, just sell cassia as cinnamon bark, trying to sell it at cinnamon bark prices. So uh, a lot of different things that happen in that fashion there too. I did not know that. And would you be able to pick that up? On oh, absolutely. Report? Like as, it, as a non sciencey person or would it just be at the science side that would be able to check to see what the ratios would need to be versus what they are presenting as? Yeah, something like that. Um, I, I, you know, if, um, depending on the skill of, of the chemist and what you're looking for, yes, we could show the comparison of where the ranges should be with various components and uh, coumarin and things like that, for, uh, for instance, with, with the cassia and it's higher in that versus in, in cinnamon bark. So there's definitely key components that um, someone who's less trained could pick up on. Um, mm -hmm. But again, uh, Dr. Satyal and, and uh, the team, the science team at doTERRA, uh, there's many, many who have spent their lives researching this and know how to do it. And uh, and we'll get into it here in just a moment, too. But uh, there's ways to tell when things have been added to it that most labs, most other companies just don't know because we're the ones who've discovered it and researched it and know how to do it. So wow. but some of these, yes, you, you could you should be able to pick up um, if you know what you're doing. Yeah. And then for the the novice essential oil user or, you know, the, the new person that's coming on board to, to want to start down this low-tox path, mm -hmm. a lot of it's based on blind trust, to, mm -hmm. to trust that what the company is saying um, mm -hmm. is 100% pure, is actually pure. And that that in itself is quite a big ask for a lot of consumers to 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 do these days, I think. Yeah, it is. It's honestly, for end consumers, it's um, it's challenging because essential oils are, are one where it's difficult to, if you got it yourself and try to find a lab that could test it and prove it's pure. Mm -hmm. I, again, that's one of the reasons that I got into this industry is I couldn't find a lab that could detect what I was doing in my past life. It was very easy to fool labs. And that's, um, you know, as I I had a, had a change of heart, if you will, and started to really see 
what was being said and how it was being presented. And I knew what was happening. I knew it wasn't what the customer wanted or expected or was paying for. That's when I wanted to get out of that industry and wanted to start into an industry that helps people know and see mm. if they're getting, if they're getting what they think they're getting. Mm. And we had a unique way of being able to do that. And we don't pretend to be perfect at it either, but um, we're dedicated to it. And we want to help people ensure that they're getting pure potent essential oils. Mm. Wow. So hopefully I, I, I uh, uh, I'm, not boring uh, too many people here, and it's still interesting, but I'm um, going to throw in a little chemistry here and kind of talk through uh, what you did a great lead into, Jess, was, okay, well, what, what are some of the things that we look for? And uh, using a very powerful tool, GCMS, uh, but there are many others um, that we use to ensure um, the CPTG uh, is, is, is met with each oil. So this is, uh, this is a pure, what's called a, a blue lavender. There's many varieties of lavender, but this is a very typical GCMS, the chemical profile that you would expect to see for a, a blue lavender. Uh, I've kind of highlighted some of the major components. There's thousands of very minor components that naturally occur in something like a lavender and in most essential oils, um, most of them are unidentified. They're just so uncommon. They're so, um, again, parts per million, some of the parts per billion where they haven't been studied and really identified. Mm -hmm. But so most people just focused on the major ones. And that's what you can see in front of you here. These are uh, some of the, the ones that I focused on in the industry that I would use to enhance, play with, adulterate <laughs> the oils in my previous life. So uh, we're gonna use walk through this a bit here as an example. And again, this is just more for show, but uh, this is the formula I would use on a very regular basis. So this is an Excel sheet that had been put together that we put in the chemistry of the oils that were pure that we wanted to take and then um, expand the supply with to, and it could be too that we wanted to make a hit at a certain range. Um, one of the the uh, buzzwords, a keyword, if you will, when I get a customer call up, um, and they would ask us to, as I was, you know, buying things from other brokers, say, "Hey, well, what's your specification? What do you want to be?" That's code for tell me what you want me to build, tell me what you want the chemistry to be, and I'll send you that. It's it's really not that wow. difficult. Uh, to be able to to get exactly what you want. Uh, a very common lavender, lavender it's called a 4042, which means it's 40% linalool, 42 linal acetate, the two major components. And it, it you know, uh, with a natural component, it's very difficult to, you know, get, say it's going to be this specific chemistry every time. But with some of the tricks of the trade, it's pretty simple to be able to add components and get the chemistry correct and exactly where you want it to be. Now, if you're trying to keep it, so to present it as it's pure, it's natural and and um, be able to sell this oil and, and pay a premium price for it because the customer believes it's untouched. This is some of the things that uh, commonly takes place. Mm. So let's, let's walk through that a little more. That's more just a Hey, this is the formula. That's actually the formula I used in creating this example that I'm going through here. So some of the components that are used. So I mentioned linal acetate is one of the major components of lavender. And you can buy linal acetate. It's even from a natural precursor. It doesn't, if you can uh, specify, it can't be synthetic, meaning um, it can't be from petroleum-based products. It's got to be from a natural precursor. Um, there's still... The chemistry isn't perfect. There's always byproducts of the chemical production process. But you see, this one is pretty pure. Uh, according to this GCMS, 99.25% of the time when you go through this chemical production process, you will get linal acetate. It's identical chemically. Um, again, in this case, if you take a natural precursor, it's natural. But uh, there's always little byproducts of that chemical reaction. And that's what we call synthetic markers. And this is what most companies don't know to look for. Because in every oil, there's always thousands of little unidentified compounds, little uh, blips in the chromatogram that are commonly ignored. Uh, you just can't look at everything. But we've identified ones that only occur when it's been synthesized. So we call them synthetic markers. And you see, a lot of times they'll 
Uh, so they're side by side. Um, they come off the column very quickly, very in sync with a linal acetate. These ones are linal oxide acetate, cis and trans, so the Z and E are cis and trans. Um, so this is what we look for and what we've named in there. And any amount of those compounds is a clear indication that this type of linal acetate has been added. Mm. So it's not necessarily about the amount of the synthetic marker that you find. If it's there, it went through a chemical synthesis process. <laughs> Pardon me. The plant doesn't naturally produce these components. And we've been very careful to look at a variety of different plants and species and ensure that our synthetic markers do not occur naturally. They only occur through a synthetic process. And so that's why they're very telling. Uh, the amount, again, doesn't matter. If it's there, it's been adulterated. And these are the type of things that, Do that doTERRA would reject without question. Mm. So, but for most of the industry, they would just be a little blip on the chromatogram, nothing to pay attention to, nothing to worry about, very normal. Very similarly, linalool, the other major component of lavender. Um, so uh, you can see it, this one actually just happened to be the exact same amount. 99.25% pure linalool is produced from this reaction. But uh, there are different things. There's a plenol, that's a more commonly known indicator of, of adulteration. But there's others where we've marked them as linalool oxides to where they're small, very similar chemical structures, but slightly different that the GCMS can pick up clear indications that this has been through a synthesis process and that linalool has been added to this lavender. Could be a bergamot, could be anything that contains lavender. If it's there at all, it's adulterated. Oh. So um, after we go through this process, we, I picked out some components and you do that with all of them. You kind of just balance it out and you, and you look at the chemistry of the pure oil and you go through and you see how much you want to add. And, and work it through. This is the end chemistry of the built lavender. It actually is in the industry, if you handed someone a GC or if they took a sample, GC it themselves and got these results, it would look very normal. It'd actually be a very attractive chemical profile for lavender. Um, and you can see on the right here too, all the red. So this is that GCMS for this, uh, all the red components there. And I apologize, I left out an important piece, lavandulal acetate. Um, is one that's not, is a component that is in lavender, but it's difficult to synthesize. So it's not a common uh, component that you could buy off of the market. And so this is what a lot of companies will look at and say, hey, well, if your linal acetate is, you know, between two and 5%, so, uh, excuse me, lavandulal acetate, I apologize, is between two and 5%. Uh, clearly, you haven't added anything to it because you haven't diluted that that biomarker, that natural marker in there. Um, in it. And so even this at 5%, you'd be like, oh, well, clearly this is a pure oil because that lavandula acetate hasn't been diluted in a Bulgarian lavender. There's mm -hmm. different types of lavender that naturally have it higher. So they're perfect precursors to be able to adulterate oil. But so when we look at these things, all these little blips that most uh, companies wouldn't pay attention to are clear indicators for us. This oil has been adulterated in, in pretty good fashion. Most labs and companies wouldn't bat an eye that it's pure and a great oil. So let's look at the comparison here of, mm -hmm. of what we've done. So here's the starting components. You can see this is where the pure oil started out as. Um, this three-octanone, um, as I kind of showed on stage there, I pick it out because it's a very unique aroma. It kind of gives lavender a pop. Um, it smells like bananas on its own. Um, and you wouldn't pick that out from smelling lavender, but if you boost it just a little bit, even put another one, one and a half percent in there, it really gives a lavender like, oh, wow, that's a great smelling lavender. And so, uh, again, that's kind of one of the benefits of this starting material. Uh, you want it to be less than 2%, but I can boost that a little bit, um, add some more osamine to balance things out. Uh, of course, take up the linalool and acetate, add some trypanine for all that kind of gives it that effervescent aroma there within the compounds. So even just focusing on these five or six components, uh, this is the end profile that we'll get. And what I've added is about 60% synthetic components. Um, uh, and so the end oil, I've more than doubled my starting oil, I've reduced my costs exponentially. This oil would probably cost half, less than half, what it would originally have cost me to purchase it. And now I've got double the amount to sell. 
uh, you can make a lot of money. I, I was told uh, by my boss, unless unless we're making 100% profit, it's not worth our time. Uh, this happens so commonly in the industry. Um, and again, I would be very comfortable sending this out to very reputable labs and they're not going to see it. Wow. That just blows my mind. And and obviously we're familiar with this. I'm not as familiar as you are, of course, but I'm familiar with what constituents are and what some of these words mean. But like we were talking about before, you know, we've got a lot of new people that are joining us in this revolution of, of low tox. You know, this is this is the way that every single market across the globe is is moving into we are we are becoming savvy consumers we want to look for natural solutions and even mm -hmm. down this path of utilizing essential oils you might think you're doing the right thing um, and now we're learning that 60 percent of that bottle of lavender that I might have spent 50 or 60 dollars on could be almost 60 percent synthetic so I've got to ask the obvious question here What's that doing for my system or my body if I have synthetic ingredients in, in my essential oil? Yeah, it's a great question. And I know it's one that, um, you know, as an essential oil consumer myself, too, I know I've asked, I'm, I'm not a doctor. Um, I work with Dr. Osgothorpe very regularly, and I always tell people, hey, my, my expertise is before it gets into a bottle, I work with everything there. After it gets into a bottle, um, Dr. Osgothorpe and his clinical team do an excellent job of researching that. Um, so with that caveat, but I will say, we don't know for the most part. There's so many, again, what we've termed synthetic markers to be able to look at uh, and identify when things have been added. What does that component do once it's in your body? Mm. I don't know. Um, one of the things that I like to look at it is, uh, you know, we, we're not entirely sure that it is these major components that are having the therapeutic impact, the um, aromatic impact that we want from the various oils that we take. And so if I'm, if if it's actually the, what we'll call it the entourage effect, if it's the accumulative, the holistic of that natural chemistry that mother nature produces within that, again, just using the same example, a lavender plant, and let's say it's those minor components that are actually combined with a dozen other minor components. And those things and those amounts are what's actually giving us that, that benefit, that restful, like helping us sleep well. If we're getting a lavender that's now been reduced by 60% uh, and we're just adding in the major components and those minor components are now 60% less than what they would be in a pure lavender, you may not get the same effect. Yeah. Who's to say that it's these major components, uh, the of five of the thousands that are in there, that are giving you that benefit that you really want? Wow. Again, I don't know that. <laughs> That's one of the ways I look at it. I do think that it's a holistic approach with the natural chemistry that's produced within these various essential oils. And, you know, Mother Nature gets it right most of the time. And she's had thousands of years to to get it right. Let's not cut her in half, uh, cut the benefits in half or more. Yeah. it's it, To me, I'm thinking of baking a cake and it's substituting some ingredients mm -hmm. in that, that recipe for something that we just don't know what it is. What if we didn't yeah. bake a cake with eggs anymore and instead we opted out for something synthetically made that we're told does the same binding as, as an egg classically would? What would that cake taste like at the end? What would it do for your body by ingesting that fake egg of sorts? I've gone down that terrible analogy path, but that's how my brain processes it. And I think of if all those tiny little synergistic components that go into that essential oil that Mother Nature has so beautifully created, why are we tampering with that when she knows what she's doing? Those plants have thrived for hundreds of thousands of years before mm -hmm. we started extracting this. Why are we touching it? Yep. Mm. And again, you've touched on really one of the cores of what doTERRA wanted to bring, why, why the founders wanted to bring the purest essential oils to the market. They'd experienced that for themselves and wanted to ensure that people could have that. And that's the core of CPTG and why they wanted to uh, create it and make it part of their internal standard that they do not waver from. 
Um, and, and that's actually, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, is a good reason for CPTG is the next closest, next best standard out there. There's no real regulating body or government restrictions around essential oils. There's no, um, there's not any in, in the world that say, hey, don't adulterate, or there's, there's any kind of watchdog for essential oil purity from a regulatory perspective. The closest thing is ISO, or the uh, International Standards Organization. But even that, so here's a uh, French Bulgarian lavender, the ISO standard. So you can see what I just built, uh, which is only 40% pure lavender, um, well within ISO standards. So even if someone looked at this and was like, okay, does it meet ISO? Yes. Um, can you give me a GCMS showing that it's it's uh, it's pure? Sure. Yep, here it is. So again, it's run, uh, one of the the beauty of CPTG is uh, there isn't anything out there that really governs this. And so it was a way for government to doTERRA themselves and stay true to what their, their ethos from the very beginning. So it is very meaningful. And everyone that works here and everything we do towards it knows that this is why. Um, and it, it's, it's why it's something that should be talked about with great pride uh, on a daily basis with CPTG absolutely is meaningful. And I'm trying to give you a glimpse of the why in, in with the rest of the industry and how it really works. Absolutely. I, I It's just mind-blowing. Uh, and I thought I understood the process, um, but this has actually amplified how important what you are doing is for this entire world. <laughs> world, because, right, you test, your team tests every essential oil batch that comes in right after we've harvested yep. those sandalwood trees after we've mm -hmm. harvested the tea tree in Australia that gets sent through to you right so that you can test it to have a look and make mm -hmm. sure guarantee it's 100% pure tea tree or 100% pure sandalwood essential oil right absolutely it goes through multiple tests where you're doing a great job of lead into different parts of the oh, conversation here oh, good. you are look at this so again, uh, this is actually just a, a smidgen here of all the various tests. So I just want to give you a flavor. Um, and for important ones that are really impactful, like GCMS, each oil goes through at least two rounds of GCMS testing at various points of the process. So before it's ever purchased, we get a pre-shipment sample. When it arrives, we test it again to ensure that it is exactly uh, the, the sample was representative of the bulk that was being purchased. So multiple phases, uh, multiple filters, if you will. And these are just some of the tests that we go through. And I could spend you know, way too much time talking about each of them and what they do, but know that uh, this is multi-layered. It's not just um, you know, one kind of filter or one kind of step that takes place here. Multiple, multiple types of tests and looking for different ways and knowing what could happen, what's likely to happen with this specific type of oil. So we need to do this test with it. Again, I could um, I could probably bore everybody, but it would be very interesting to me to, to go into all that there. But know that there's dozens and dozens of different tests that each oil goes through to ensure their CP, meet CPTG standards. Maybe we can do a follow-up early next year. <laughs> Let's do another expansion. We can see what the market says, what the field is saying at the moment. Do we want to know more? Because I know that they will, and we can do another interview. <laughs> this is just absolutely incredible. I should say, too, you know, again, like, um, so APRC was just one component of some of that testing, and doTERRA wanted to ensure that they had in-house and were doing themselves. We still use many, many outside labs. There's research facilities, um, and so, uh, again, from a independent perspective, uh, doTERRA's always done that. And frankly, I think they could do a better job of saying, hey, we work with multiple research institutes, multiple universities, multiple just independent labs in a variety of ways for all of our products. So uh, this isn't just us saying it or saying that, you know, trust us, it's coming just from us. Although we do have a certain set of skills that are unique. Um, we do also utilize other experts uh, throughout the process too. Yeah, right. So even though APRC or your, your testing um, has been brought in-house to doTERRA, we're still testing our essential oils with multiple third parties so that we can still say simply our, our CPTG model is independently tested. 
to certify yes. pure tested grade essential oils, 100% pure. Yep. So it is, and there's a lot of that. So, of course, elements of it are tested in-house. There's other elements that are more appropriately done out of house and through a variety of things. So CBDG is, is a lot of different things. Um, and, and the testing portion of that is done in a variety of ways with a variety of labs and, and people. Mm. Wow. So... Um, I'll go through this uh, uh, a little quickly, but uh, again, GCMS is, you know, is almost designed specifically to test essential oils. Again, where they're light compounds, they're aromatic compounds, they, they volatilize very easy. Gas chromatography, mass spectrometry is almost the perfect tool for looking at all the compounds within an, an essential oil. And so I just wanted to give a little bit of a background stuff to what GCMS is. And so really, it's, it's made up of two parts, and there's a little video hill that I'll, that I'll talk through and explain, hopefully in sync with the video. Mm -hmm. But uh, the gas chromatography side is basically a big oven with a column in it. So as you inject the sample, a carrier gas pushes that through. And then as the components come through, the lighter compounds will move through more quickly. They're faster. The heavier, bulkier compounds will move slower through the column. So it naturally separates all the components within the essential oil, and it goes into the mass spec side, and that's the detector. And so it measures the mass of it. It also measures fragmentation patterns. It'll go through and uh, be able to uh, see these you now separated compounds, identify them, and the more of them that come through, um, the higher the peak will be on the chromatogram. So it's really an area uh, uh, that comes through uh, the way that it detects it. So you see the different spikes. If you've seen a GCMS, the higher the peak, really it's the greater the area tells you how much of that compound. So GCMS is really ideal for identification of what the compound is, but also gives you a very good indicator of how much of that compound is in the oil too. Mm -hmm. So very powerful tool that we use multiple times throughout the CPTG process. That's very clever. <laughs> So again, and so this is what I mentioned here. Um, this is a, a snippet from a chromatogram. It's actually uh, just, we've zoomed in quite a bit. Um, and this is what'll come off as the interpretation after it's gone through the column, through the gas chromatography side, gone into the detector under the mass spec. And this is how it will be read and what we see here. And based off of the retention time, but also, as I mentioned, fragmentation patterns, the mass of the compound uh, compounds as they come out, so this is uh, just an indication here. So this little blip, and this is zoomed in quite a bit, that little peak right there, clear indication that this is an adulterated oil. Now, again, uh, most companies would, most labs wouldn't know to look for that, um, but we pay very close attention to this type of thing mm -hmm. and know that uh, this is not something that would meet doTERRA standards. So uh, as I kind of building out here too, uh, one of the things that I, I hope I've been able to convey is CPTG is, um, is complex. It's very much related to other programs within doTERRA. It helps with healing hands. It's, it's the right hand in glove with strategic sourcing and all the initiatives that happen there. But uh, uh, CPTG is so many things. It's, it's being at source and knowing the farmers, but it's not just that. It's also where you need to understand the distillers and be able to get in and know what's the right way to distill this, uh, times to distill it. Uh, and then it's understanding what may happen, what's, what are the various ways that you can adulterate this oil, even at that stage there. It's going through and it's understanding the, the, uh, the brokers and the, and the process that could happen there. What is their, their tricks of the trade and what should you look for in that? And it's then getting into the testing side and being able to know, okay, now I can test this oil that I've got it. What are some steps that I can take to ensure that it's pure and natural? And uh, then you can run it through multiple different types of tests and being able to see different elements and things you're looking for and using outs outside sources, uh, internal knowledge, working with the various teams of the science that are happening here, and then ensuring that you've got the right knowledge of, in, of storing it properly, putting it in the proper package and keeping it so that it is entirely pure. Once you take all of these things together and more, then that's what CPTG is. And you get a, a, a better picture of the whole and you can see things much more clearly with all of those elements combined together. And it's very unique. 
there really isn't any other company in the world that takes the effort and the time and the, the work to, to do this. And they, they doTERRA, we doTERRA, term that CPDG. And that's why it's so meaningful. And I hope that I've been able to convey my part of that and why I'm so passionate about it, because I've been helpful in helping it to continue to grow. It's evolving too, as we continue to learn more and understand how different techniques and as adulteration continue to get better, we're going to continue to stay in line with being able to detect that and avoid it. Uh, it's a living process that will continue to change and grow over time. And I'm excited to be a part of it. Each of you should be too. Like shout it from the rooftops of, hey, this is CBTG is meaningful and doTERRA oils are absolutely different than any other oil on the market today. Oh, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that you've done a remarkable job at simplifying what no doubt is a very difficult job, <laughs> dealing with lots of difficult elements and trying to stay one step ahead, I guess, of um, the, the war against adulteration, if we can put it in that framework. Because realistically, to me, it feels like a bit of a war. I don't want to be blindsided as a consumer. I don't want to uh, have to second guess company standards um, and, and worry that the products that I'm putting on my child's skin who might have eczema or irritations or we might have a struggling teenager who doesn't want to go to school and we want to be able to provide the emotional support for them for the, the products that we're using around our homes like low-tox cleaning to hair care to skin care. We are mm -hmm. consistently, I think more so than ever, being exposed to so many different toxins and environmental threats in this commercial world that we live in. And the one thing that I think I can trust most in this world at the moment is the fact that the products that I'm currently using, the lifestyle that I'm leading with doTERRA at the forefront of this, I have absolutely converted into the low-tox lifestyle, um, it's giving me a huge amount of empowerment. I feel like I'm doing the right thing and the kids, my husband, the extended family are all benefiting because of what you are doing and your team are doing and what the founders have recognised 15 years ago when they launched doTERRA. So we are so, we should be grateful. And if anyone who's watching this today doesn't feel that that tug on the heartstring to know that you are part of an incredible change, this is so important. And like you said, we should be shouting this from the rooftops. This is important. Thank you. Very well said. Appreciate oh, that. Thank you. Well, I can't thank you enough uh, for what you've done for Australia and New Zealand over the past week. Uh, we've had the CPTG tour. We've hit five cities across six days. It's mammoth. It's a lot of talking. And yeah. obviously the voice is a bit tickling. Still got a bit of a sore throat, as you can tell. <laughs> That's what happens, right? But yep. we are just so incredibly thankful for your time, for your your mind, your clever mind, for working alongside um, the incredible team with doTERRA Corporate to, to bring this to life. So thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions or wants to delve deeper into this entire topic, we're here to support you guys. This is a journey. And like Aaron said, uh, it's a living, breathing movement. And so we want to make sure that we are helping everybody to understand the importance of CPTG and how doTERRA are the missing link in this essential oil market and how what we are doing is so incredible. So please reach out if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to share your questions along to Aaron. And hey, if we get enough responses, we might even be able to do a part two of this series and delve even deeper into CPTG. But for now, thank you, Aaron, for joining us. This has been absolutely incredible. And for everybody at home, I hope you have enjoyed this episode. This is going down in the history books as one of my favourites. So bye for now. <laughs>